Thank you, Reverend Anne. It's been years since a beautiful lady called me Sugar. I accept that blessing with, for all that it intends from your heart to mine. Good morning, beautiful, international, worldwide, Temple of Light family. It is a joy for me to add my own words of welcome to each and every one of you and to just say that although I cannot see you, I can feel the energy of love that binds us all together across the globe with cords of everlasting unity. It's so funny that Reverend Anne introduced me as Sugar because my encouragement actually echoes a question my mom asked me when I was about eight or nine years old and I've it titled my encouragement after that question she asked. Let me just tell you the story very quickly. As about eight or nine, I was in the garden on the swing one Sunday afternoon with the little girl from next door. And my studious brother, Dennis, was in the house. He had been given a set of 35 Encyclopedia Britannicas, huge tomes full of all the knowledge of the world. And he was reading them cover to cover. I think he was at about volume 25 or 26. So he was sitting in the living room beside the telephone. In those days, of course, there were no portable phones. It was a, a, a phone plugged into the wall. And he was sitting there reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. And the phone began to ring. So my mother calls through the kitchen window and says, Johnny, don't you hear the phone ringing, child? Come and answer it. I said, Mama, Dennis is sitting beside the phone. And she said, well, he's not connected to the outside world. He's thinking. So I got off the swing really annoyed, as you may imagine, walked into the house, picked up the phone and said, hello. And there was a lady on the other end of the line saying, may I speak to your brother? I said, no, you may not. He's not connected. He's thinking. Well, my mother flew out of the kitchen and said, with a slap, and said, who do you think you are, child, speaking to people in that acerbic tone of voice? Who do it? Just who do you think you are? The title of my encouragement this morning. Who do you think you are? And I, being a saucy eight-year-old, said, I'm a child of God, I was taught in Sunday school. She said, well, go to your room and write 100 lines, I am a child of God. And that was my introduction to affirmations. You know, friends, Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this amazing teaching, this transformative teaching, this life-altering teaching, known as the science of mind and spirit, wrote in the science of mind textbook, and I quote, the finite alone has wrought and suffered. I suffered writing those hundred lines too. The infinite lies stretched in smiling repose. God is always God. No matter what our emotional storm or what our objective situation may be, there is always something hidden in the inner being that has never been violated. We may stumble. But always there is that eternal voice forever whispering within our air, that thing which causes the eternal quest, that thing which forever sings and sings. That thing which forever sings and sings. It's the end of that quote. But my friends, the challenge then is, how do we stay connected to that presence and power which forever sings and sings? Before we can answer that question, we need to answer the first question, who do you think you are? Someone once told me a story about a young lawyer who had just opened her office and of course she wanted to impress her clients, so she put all her tomes, you know, her legal tomes on the shelves. And um, on Monday morning when she was opening, she was still in the, in the waiting area, the reception area, choreographing that when a man walked in. And wanting him to think that she was busy, she picked up the phone and she began pretending that she was talking to a client. And she talked and she talked and she talked and she put that client on hold and she talked to another. And after about 15 minutes, she hung and said, how may we help you? And he looked at her very strangely indeed and said, I don't think you can help me, ma'am, but I can help you. I'm here to connect the phone. My friends, as practitioners of the science of man, we know that so often we go through the motions, don't we? Without being really connected. And my mom had said, then this isn't connected to the outside world. What an interesting statement for her to have made. We know that that connection is a bridge from us to the eternal. 
from that thing to that thing which forever sings and sings at the center of our being, that thing which, which if we just would be still for a few moments every day, we would connect with in a way that is unbelievable. And we would feel the peace that comes from being in close contact with that indwelling God, which is unperturbed by any of the circumstances of the outside world, any of the conditions that we consider uh, problems and challenges to the human condition. So I want you to write an affirmation for me today, and that affirmation is an affirmation of peace. Just, just think about the peace that you, you want to experience and to share uh, with your family at home as you are um, going about your daily affairs, but also the peace that you want to, to flow out from you, to fill your neighborhood, to fill your island or your country or city, and, and indeed to, to fill the entire world. And so I want you to write an affirmation of peace. Something, something like, I, I am the peace, and that peace begins with me. For I am God's peace, and that peace begins with me. Put it on little sticky notes all over the house and all over, um, you know, where you can see it regularly. Just so that it reminds you to affirm that you are the peace that passes all human understanding. I am a pathway to peace. I like that. I am a pathway to peace. Recently, I, I, I asked viewers to write affirmations for me. And when I did, a friend of mine said, do you really think that affirmations work? Or are, we just, are you just fooling yourselves, you people that, that, that call yourself new thought and science of man, that you are trying to speak something impossible into me? So I said, no, saying an affirmation really is a powerful way of programming our subconscious mind, of reprogramming our subconscious mind with the truth that we want to experience. And my cynical friend said, well, I think it's the equivalent of a magician saying abracadabra. Well, I found that an interesting comment, since I don't know if you know, but it is believed that abracadabra actually comes from an Aramaic phrase, abracadabra. And abracadabra translates as, let it be created as it is spoken. Let it be created as it is spoken. Now, when you get asked that question, who do you think you are, you may say, you may have very many different answers, but let it be created, let your answer be created as it is spoken. Jesus the Master, Jesus, the master Teacher used many powerful affirmations that affirm his divinity. And there's a lovely story in Matthew 16, verses 13 to 17, which relates how he once asked his disciples, and I quote, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he asked, the same question my mother asked, but a little differently. But who say ye that I am? Who say ye that I am? So I've come today to encourage you to ask that question of spirit. But who say ye that I am? Last Tuesday, practitioner Carol Campbell, wearing a beautiful jeweled mask, spoke about who is behind the mask. So your assignment, and I always give an assignment when I speak, your assignment, should you decide to undertake it this week, is to listen to Carol's talk if you haven't heard it before, or re-listen to it, it's really worth a second listen. And then sit quietly with your journal to hand, and a pen or a pencil in your hand, and ask Spirit, Father, Mother, God, who do you say I am? Who am I? Who am I really? And then I want you to write at least 20 responses. I'll send to give you the same lines my mother gave me, 100, but I'll settle for 20. Write 20 responses to that question. And I want you to really dig deep. What does it really mean when you say, I'm Jamaican, or I'm an American, or an African American, or I'm a man or I'm a woman, I'm gay or straight or transgender, I'm a son, a daughter, a lover, a wife, a husband, or a friend. What does that really, really mean? I'm sure that our friends from the Kiwanis Club of Constant Spring who are celebrating with us today, often say, I'm a Kiwanian. Well, this week, 
sit down with a pen and, and pencil, a pen and paper and ask yourself, what does that really mean? You know, I'm sure you often affirm at your meetings your wonderful uh, motto, or your wonderful mission, serving the children of the world, one child, one community at a time. Do you affirm that I'm a Kiwanian and I'm serving the children of the world? And then you leave your meeting and a little street child comes to wipe your windshield and you feel the, the annoyance and the impatience and perhaps even the anger welling up in your heart. So really look at, at yourself and see whether your values and your behaviors and the way you have of being in the world really is congruent with who you say you are. Ask spirit, who say me that I am? And you know, my friends, perhaps the answer can be found in the answer that Peter gave to the Jesus, the, the, the beautiful way, sure, to that million dollar question, when Jesus said, but who say ye that I am? And I can just imagine the awkward silence as the disciples puzzled over Jesus' meaning and searched themselves for an answer, until Peter braved a response. And this is what he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. End of that quote. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. For listen to this, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. End of that quote. My friend, the point is being made here that no matter what it is that we are appraising, we cannot really know someone by means of our knowledge of his or her background or by any kind of analysis of his or her character. The only correct evaluation of anyone is in terms of what they can be, their divine, God-given potential. And so before this, this pandemic, uh, when all of the classes at the General Penitentiary, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life, uh, came to a halt, and we were working on, on, on giving them Zoom classes through their computer lab. But every Tuesday when I present myself at the, at the main gate of the prison, I say to myself, look for the Christ. Look for the Christ in the officers and in the, in the, the warders and in the, the people in my class and the people who are not in my class. Just look for the Christ. Because when you look for Christ, you find him shining. And remember, the Christ isn't a person. It wasn't Jesus' last name. The Christ is the principle of your sonship and daughtership with the living Spirit Almighty. And so Jesus was saying to Peter, you didn't arrive by this, by means of my personality or my physical stature or by anything that came from observation. You have had a revelation of the divinity within me and you have seen the Christ not by your sight, but by your insight. As the story continues in Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19, Jesus is so delighted with this evidence of spiritual discernment that he says, and I quote, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. End of quote. My friends, some Christian churches have taken these words of the Master Teacher literally. But what did Jesus really have in mind? Remember, the man we call Peter was really named Simon. This is an interesting, I don't know if it's a little known fact, but I, I, I find it fascinating. Peter was a nickname used only after this incident. The very first time it was used was when Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The nickname was used to praise a quality displayed by Simon, and that quality was Petros in Greek, which is the Greek term similar to our word faith. It means rock-like steadfastness. So upon this rock-like steadfastness, this rock-like faith, I will build something. The Jamaicans viewing this, this, this love stream will smile with me because we in Jamaica often refer to our island as the rock or jam rock. So
So very often when I read that scripture, upon this rock I will build, I think, yes, God was speaking about my island home. Anyway, Jesus is praising Simon, now Peter, for being able to, per to perceive the truth. And he's saying that it is upon this kind of perception and steadfastness that the church must be built. Again, let us remember, my friends, that the term church didn't mean a building or an institution that we have, as we've come to know it. The church which Jesus used, the term church that Jesus used meant called out ones. I shall build upon this steadfastness and this faith the called out ones that have been called to serve, have been called to spread love, have been called to see the Christ, the divinity in all humankind. And so my friends, the church that Jesus is talking about building upon the rock of steadfast faith is not the Vatican in Rome or the Temple of Light in beautiful Jamaica or any other structure, however beautiful and impressive or humble and, and, and holy it may be. The church the Master is referring to is our inner life our consciousness upon the rock, the firm foundation of, of faith, the certain assurance of who we are when we say, I am a son or a daughter of God, upon that rock of faith, upon that steadfastness and that spiritual perception and spiritual discernment, God is building a world that works for everyone and he's using each one of us as a building block. So we interpret the beautiful affirmation of Jesus for ourselves. If you are a Jamaican, you can say, and I quote, Upon this rock of steadfast faith, we are called out to behold all people as the Christ, the sons of the living God. And if you are not a Jamaican, you can say, Upon the rock of steadfast faith, we are called out to behold all people as the Christ, the sons and daughters of the living God. What an assignment for us to, to take. Who do you say you are? I am a son or daughter of the living God. So as you do your assignment this week, my friends, asking spirit, but who do you say I am? Please remember that humanly, you may be physically challenged, you may be experiencing disease or a diagnosis that's, that's frightening, or you may be feeling discouraged, isolated, or insufficient. But this is only one facet of the eternal performance of your immortal spirit on your journey to mastery. And believe me, you have come. You have been called out to work on the mastery that is yours by divine right of being. You are not the limited person that you may have been told that you are or that you might think you are. Within you is the original perfection created by a perfect intelligence. You are a perfect idea in the mind of God, and your soul has been called out to express the glorious potential that you are, that you always have been. You are in reality the church, the called out ones. It is upon the foundation of your consciousness that God is building a world that truly works for everyone. You know, my friends, we're talking about the new normal. Things are never going to go back to the old so-called normal. We have, we have experienced a change and a transformation and a shift in consciousness for the better. And more love and more, more understanding and more caring and more togetherness has been born through each one of us as a result of this pandemic. Dr. Ernest Holmes expressed it like this. There is hidden within the mind of man a divinity. There is incarnated in you and me that which is an incarnation of God. This divine sonship is not a projection of that which is unlike our nature. It is not a projection of the divine into the human. God cannot project himself outside himself. God can only express himself within himself. Man is not an individual in God. Man is an individualization of God. There is no God beyond truth and no revelation higher than the realization of the divinity within us. End of quote. Meister Eckhart, the 13th century theologian and mystic, put it this way. The seed of God is in us. Pear seeds grow into pear trees. Nut seeds into nut trees. 
and God sees into God. And so my friends, when life demands of you, who do you think you are? Speak the powerful word of truth. Stand up and affirm for yourself, I am the son or daughter of the living God. And then shout, Hallelujah! God loves you and so do I. Namaste.